everyone. Um, I'm Andrea Krokramer, and this is Heather Will. And we're here to talk about Pearl in the Sand, um, the book that we've been reading. Um, I know in some of our discussion questions and our time spent together, the question become was, what's up with this Christian fiction? What's real? What's not real? And I, who could I go to but Father Will here? And he so graciously decided to say, yes, let me tell you about the story of Rahab. So, Father, what's the real story? We're reading Christian fiction. But does Rahab really exist? Is it, is, it, is it a story in the Bible? Yeah, yeah. I think it's helpful to even just kind of make the analogy of like the chosen. Oh, yeah. It's a lot like the chosen of, you know, the Bible kind of provides the skeleton for the story. And, you know, the story is just kind of fleshing out more of, you know, going deeper into the history of the relationships, the interactions, things like that. So so Rahab is is a real biblical figure. Okay. Uh, she comes up in the book of Joshua. And Joshua is kind of like this this epilogue to kind of Exodus, Deuteronomy of you know the Moses has led the chosen people out of Egypt through the desert to the promised land, mm -hmm. but he himself doesn't get to go in. Joshua, his successor, is the one who leads leads the chosen people into the promised land. So he you know crosses the Jordan River and you know conquers all these cities, including Jericho, of course, and that's where we encounter. Rahab. So Joshua yeah, just kind of picks up right where it leaves off, and Joshua, you know, is kind of on this campaign, bringing the promise, the chosen people into the promised land. And the first city, the very first city that they really conquer is Jericho. So they have this encounter of their two spies sent. Which oh, I believe, so the spies yep. do exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. great. Yep. So the two spies exist as well, and Joshua sends them out because you know God has said, you know, I'm gonna give you Jericho. And so, and, and they go out, these two spies, and they go to Jericho to kind of, you know, see what's what's going on there, kind of give Joshua a report. And, you know, of course, they're trying to, to hide from the authorities, from other soldiers, things like that. And so they, they knock on this door of Rahab. And Rahab, in the Bible, is described as, you know, a prostitute or a harlot or whichever translation uh, you go with. Um, but, you know, they know that that's, that's who she is, and she immediately, you know, takes them in willingly, that they don't, you know, force her or anything, um, but that, you know, I believe, like in the story, uh, she's, you know, someone who she almost wants to, to mm -hmm. hide them, that, you know, not just to save her own neck, uh, but beautifully, she's motivated by faith, actually, faith in the one true God. Uh, that this profession of faith is, is in the Bible, and it's, it's really beautiful. So if you get the chance to go and read the book of Joshua, it's pretty short. The story of Rahab is very short, much shorter part of it as well. But this beautiful profession of faith of, you know, I have heard, you know, everyone's been hearing of these marvelous and amazing deeds that your God has done. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I now know that there is no other God than, than your God, that this, you know, this Yahweh is the one true God, and that, you know, she believes in him and chooses to have faith in him and says like, you know, if you're his servants, then I'm going to do, you know, whatever you ask because, uh, you know, because obviously you were working for the one true God. And, but she asks, of course, you know, I just ask that you spare me, spare me and spare my family. You know, if, if I hide you, um, just please do that. And they agree. And, you know, and she hides them and then, you know, of course she lets them escape and they, they go on their way. So. And she had all this faith. I mean, even without any training, mm -hmm. I mean, because she's living with pagans. They even yeah. had prostitution mm -hmm. in the temples. Mm -hmm. That was one of the questions we had. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and it's and that that was something that happened, and that's not necessarily in the Book of Joshua, but other places in the Bible, and you know, some of these things we get just from uh, from history, from other history books, from archaeology, things like that, that we know. Uh, the Canaanites were into some pretty dark things, uh, you know, this kind of cultic ritual prostitution in the temple, in their temples, uh, and as part of their worship, you know, child sacrifice was something yeah. that they, and other human sacrifice, something they were very much into. Uh, and just, yeah, kind of all these very dark and kind of evil ways of, of worship, you know. So it wasn't just they were doing these evil things, it was how they worshiped, it was how they, you know, brought honor, you know, right. to their gods. So this is a big shift. Yeah, you're right. This is a big shift for Rahab. You know, this isn't something she's exposed to before. This is kind right. of brand new. And she's just kind of given this gift of faith. And she just freely accepts it and says yes. Mm -hmm. 
So does that cord exist that was hiding outside of her house? And like, do you think the walls really came down? I mean, did that, what did the Bible say about those things or didn't it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question too. And yes, yeah, so the scarlet, there's the scarlet cord as it's described as in the Bible that's, that exists, you know, so it's how she lowers the, the spies down mm. uh, to help them escape. But it's also what they tell her, you know, leave the, leave the scarlet cord hanging outside your window. And everyone will know that, you know, this is the house of Rahab and that she is not to be messed with, you know, that she's protected. And anyone in the house with her and your family and relatives, they're protected as well. So, um, yeah, so it's a beautiful image, too, of this kind of going back to, um, you know, in the Exodus, uh, the Passover, when kind of the, the Hebrew people, the Israeli people are, you know, in their last night in Egypt, you know, the angel of death comes and all the firstborn sons die. But the only ones that are spared are those who have the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, on the lintel of their of their doors, and like that, you know, it's kind of symbolic of you know the blood of the lamb, this red cord, uh, kind of sparing the house of Rahab as well. So it's kind of you know, there's there's meant to be very clearly uh, this kind of harkening back to hey, what's happening here is as significant as you know, or you know, almost as significant as the Passover in Egypt. So it's kind of this new Passover yeah. happening in the Holy Land for the first time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and the walls too. Uh, I guess about that is the walls that, you know, there's plenty of people who have argued in the past and, you know, secular people and atheists who have said it didn't happen. It's all fake. But we know now, uh, and there's, there's enough evidence uh, to say that actually Jericho, which does exist even today, hmm. and, you know, is a very, it's one of the oldest cities on earth. <laughs> Uh, it's ten. It's like I think it's you know over ten thousand years old. Something crazy. Sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but that at the time that they're describing, like you know, fifteen or thirteen or BC, somewhere between there, that the walls that were around Jericho, there were these brick walls, and that there's there's the evidence of them that they fell down mm -hmm. and not inward, like it would happen if you're attacking a city, but outward, mm -hmm. uh, which the only thing that could do that, you know all at once, which is how it happened, uh, would be, you know, a natural disaster, an earthquake, uh, which is kind of, you know, crazy to think about, like, oh, so like when they describe in the Bible, too, uh, that this procession happens, yes. you know, seven days procession, and, you know, in silence, which you kind of think is probably pretty intimidating, uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, the last day, the shouting, and this, you know, it's this kind of great, almost rumbling and everything, and this, and that the walls just fall down, you think, like, okay, that sounds a lot like an earthquake, yeah, <laughs> you, know? Right. you know, so it's, so it's, yeah, so it's very likely that, yeah, this actually did happen to Jericho in the time period that the Bible is describing, which, you know, there's a lot of Bible stories we don't have that clear of evidence for, so it's pretty cool to see, yeah, yeah this is, you know, this isn't just, we didn't just make this up, like, you know, this happened, God worked in this way, so. Well, and what do you say to some of our discussions? We were thinking, boy, I mean, God came in and kind of wiped them all out, minus Rahab and her family. Mm -hmm. There were kids, there were children, um, moms, dads. Mm -hmm. Were they all bad? Uh, why would God do something like that and mm -hmm. take them out? And so, what are some of the different theories on why? Because we struggle. I mean, we struggled with it. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I'd say it's not a new struggle in any way. That it's actually very old. You know. Ever since the early church, people have questioned this and looked mm. at it as kind of uncomfortable. To the point of some people, you know, formed heresies about it. And they like, we're just going to reject the Old Testament because there's too many things that mm. don't make sense for a good God to do. We just can't handle that. So we're going to say they aren't even the real God. Uh, so, you know, we don't believe that. Of course, we accept the whole Bible. Right. <laughs> it's Catholics. Um, but yeah, and, but just saying that, you know, it's not something that others haven't struggled with, that it's, it's normal to struggle with it, and almost good in a way, because it yeah. helps us understand it more deeply. But a few theories, kind of, you know, over many centuries, different theologians, different saints, doctors of the church have uh, kind of come up with, and there's no one that's like, you know, this is the perfect answer, or this is, you know, what the church affirms and nothing else, yeah. you know, there's, there's freedom to kind of see what each can offer, but a few different ones. Um, I'd say a, a good kind of background to this would be knowing from Rahab's words, which otherwise we wouldn't know, but from Rahab's words, her profession of faith actually gives us an insight into what things were like right before Israel, I mean, attacks, and they don't even attack. God brings the victory. Um, 
but she says, you know, everyone knows. Mm-hmm. Everyone's been hearing about all these mighty deeds, these miracles that, you know, they cross the Jordan River and the Jordan River stopped flowing for them, right. like the Red Sea. So it's like, you know, people are going to be like, mm. <laughs> you know, like, like something crazy is happening with these, you know, outsiders who are just all of a sudden coming in in these huge numbers. And, you know, and they're very clearly coming for their city that they know, Rahab knows, and other people know that they're, they're going to yeah. try and attack their city or something like that. So just like today, throughout history, you know, if you knew someone was coming to attack your city, if you're not, you know, if you're not ready to fight, you're gonna you're gonna get out of dodge. <laughs> you know? Sure. Yeah. You know, which is going to include probably most likely majority of women and children anyway. I know. And and again, so that's not a you know, perfect explanation to say like, well, no one Issa was was killed or anything like that, but just say like, okay, there was a chance for them to escape, very much so. That anyone, you know, would would have escaped. And knowing that a lot of these cities later on get rebuilt mm-hmm. after they're destroyed. Because the same people come back, and it's like, you know, so the Bible will say everyone was destroyed, but then it's like, well, and the city was rebuilt by the same people. It's like, okay, so not everyone's destroyed. <laughs> you know, so, so so there's that, too. Um, but then also uh, from uh, from that, we can also see, too, from Rahab that she was freely able to join uh, join the people of Israel, that they didn't, you know, shun her. And maybe, maybe the book just might, you know, go a little bit more into that, but as far as the Bible tells us, that it was almost kind of an immediate acceptance. Um, you know, of course, maybe it was a little bit difficult, but but she was, there was no question of like, well, maybe not. It's like, no, nope, like, if you want to serve the one true God, you're free to serve the one true God. Like, you know, you can join us. Give up everything else. Mm-hmm. Yep, like you're willing to give up everything else, you can come to our side. So, so there's this freedom to come to the side of Israel. There's also this freedom to escape. So really the people who are staying are the people who are, you know, utterly rejecting, you know, that this is any real God, that this is, that these are the chosen people, um, you know, probably people who are willing to fight, even though they, you know, they can at least tell that these people are something, to, you know, they're not to be messed with. So, you know, there'd be some pretty bold people left over as well. Um, but then I'd also say kind of the, you know, in different, and kind of getting into different, like, kind of explanations or theories uh, from, from saints of the church, things like that, from theologians. Um, one could be, that, you know, which it is true that God is the God of life and death. And we hear this repeatedly uh, throughout the Bible. And thinking of, you know, we often think of our lives of like, you know, I, you know, when we say this, you know, very, very rightly so, you know, we have a right to life. Um, but the right doesn't come from us. Right. <laughs> it's a God given right Correct. to life. <laughs> you know? uh, that God gives us life mm-hmm. as a gift and it's totally unmerited. It's something we never deserve. But, that means also at the same time that if he takes that life back to himself, that in a way, you know, it's not that he's doing evil. You know, if we take another life, well, we have no right over that. We have no right over anyone else's life um, and not even really our own, you know. Um, so any anything like that would be sinful. Um, but seeing as it is God and, you know, it's not he's torturing these people, but just ending their lives. That it's like, okay, well, he's simply taking back the gift that he gave. Also. You know, another thing to point out, too, would be that, you know, God doesn't, you know, end this life in this world and that's it. Of course, we know with God, there's eternity. Uh, that, you know, time and again throughout the Bible, you know, we see that, you know, those who are truly innocent, those who are, you know, kind of downtrodden in this life, uh, that they're blessed yeah. in the next, that God raises them to new life for eternity. Uh, so it's not something that, okay, well, God ends these people's lives and robs them of any chance of being happy. Well, really, if, you know, if, if, if they're if they're good, if they've lived their lives, if they're, they're truly innocent, then, you know, we believe that through Jesus that God is going to bring them back to himself in heaven for eternity, which is a pretty good deal. Um, but yeah, but then kind of, and then kind of going to some other explanations as well is um, something else that can be focused on too is Kind of going from the point of seeing the story as an analogy, okay. uh, and some some try and go as far as to say, you know, Jericho never happens because, you know, it's kind of easy to explain why it's like, well, you know, it's easy to say, you know, how does God do this? Well, He never did it, so <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of, it seems like a cheap cop out to me, but you can still see it as an analogy, even if it's you know real real life event. Um, but seeing to teach us something very true about the spiritual life. And seeing that when it comes to sin, when it comes to the works of death, 
that we can have a that we have to have a zero tolerance policy uh, that we can't compromise with the enemy with Satan. You know, he's always going to win in that game. Uh, that we can't just you know try and be like, well, if I just you know if I still a little bit of vice into my life, well, that vice is going to take over. <laughs> you know? Unless we totally reject sin uh, and you know go to God all by God's grace, of course, then you know then sin is always going to have its have its take on us. That it's going to it's going to have its hold on us. So that's something else that can be taken from that as well. But also seeing it too, which you know is very clearly how the scripture is intended, how like in the book of Joshua, how it's meant to be seen is that all of these things are also very, that happen up to the fall of Jericho and all these things are actually very liturgical, mm -hmm. uh, which might sound weird at first, um, but the word that for this, this event that's called the ban uh, sometimes, or you know, total destruction, okay. um, that the Hebrew word is actually just really means an offering. Uh, an offering to God uh, in the terms of a sacrifice, like a holocaust. And a holocaust is just simply an animal that's, you know, sacrificed and totally burnt. You know, it's like everything's burned to ash. Nothing's left over. Everything's dedicated to God. You don't get to save an individual for yourself and have a cookout later. You know, <laughs> um, you know so, so it's, you know, everything's for God and for, for no one else. So, so there's this sense of, like, this total destruction and burning of the city. You know, why is the fire necessary, you might think? Like, well, that's part of a holocaust, part of an offering. You know, why is it, why do they go around the city walls for seven days? Mm. <laughs> you know, for seven days, it's like, well, that's kind of weird. It's like, oh, okay, seven days. The seventh day is the Sabbath. Yeah. The seventh day is God's day. It's the day of rest. And then you've done six days of work. And also, you can, you can think of it, too, of like the trumpets are something that, you know, we don't. We don't often use trumpets in mass, but like trumpets were very liturgical for them. They were used for worship, but also for battle. And the priests are the ones who lead it. The Ark of the Covenant leads it. Um, and every, you know, the whole people are, you know, in very, it's very orderly how it goes. And, you know, this final day, of course, you know, it's seven, and then it's another seven times around the walls. Yeah. So, you know, number seven comes with a lot. It's a holy number. And, you know, the it's by trumpet blasts, you know, which is like, a form of worship in a way that the walls come tumbling down. So it's it's by God's power, but it's almost through this almost kind of like liturgical action that's through worship of the one true God that he brings victory. So it's not just God does it and they sit back. It's them participating with God, worshiping God and acknowledging before everyone else that like this is the one true God. And you can also think of it too as like if there's six days you kind of can still maybe have a chance to be like, okay, these people are kind of creeping out. There's walking around in silence, <laughs> you, know, you know, around our walls every day. Like something bad is going to happen. Like you probably have a little bit more time to flee. Yeah. 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 So you can even see it as a warning too of like, hey, God, the God of gods is coming. Like, yeah. you know, if you're not on his side. You have a choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can see that as that too. But yeah, so anyway, a lot of explanations. There's probably even more, but hopefully that's something helpful. Again, this is a very old thing to struggle with and you know uncomfortable passage for a lot of people but i think it's helpful just to you know we're not afraid of getting down and dirty and you know, just kind of see like hey this is a kind of a hard passage to read and that's okay we can we can go in freedom and know that god is still good god is still love so like but then how do we understand it in that context so super helpful didn't yeah. come up with that at all in our discussions mm -hmm. um one thing that did come up was is rahab really in the genealogy of mm -hmm. um jesus mm -hmm. too yeah yeah so yeah so it's a good another good question that actually yeah so it's not you know obviously in the, in the book of joshua because jesus comes a lot later but we hear in the gospel of matthew and his genealogy of jesus we hear that you know rahab specifically the spouse of Salmon. Ah, so, you know, there it is. Question. <laughs> another, another question. He's in there too. Oh yeah. Yep. So he he's a real guy, real guy, spouse of Rahab, and and he is kind of I mean mentioned in the Old Testament, mentioned in, in Joshua is they're not together in the Book of Joshua, so we don't really learn that until Gospel of Matthew uh, that they were married. But you know he was probably some higher up general, you know, kind of like the the book says, you know, close to Joshua. Um, someone important in the people of Israel. And yeah, we learned from Matthew that, yeah, he did indeed marry um, Rahab and actually is uh, 
and hopefully I'm going to get this right, and a great or great great grandmother of uh, more a few more of that of King David. Oh, okay. Yeah, of King David, which is like even more like oh wow, you know like and obviously David is one of Jesus' ancestors, so it's not just a random line, but it's like you know through King David, you know she's one of you know the greatest king of Israel ever, and then you know obviously then Jesus, you know, the Son of God. So it's, yeah, it's a pretty significant role. Well, that was the last question, and the, mm -hmm. does this guy exist? Does this, mm -hmm. well, we said Salmon, Salomon, Salon. Yeah. So yeah. you're saying it. Yeah, but I I try to look it up, so I think it's Salmon. Salmon, okay, and <laughs> no, he does yeah. exist. This is he does he, exist. Because he's a yeah. hunk of a guy in this story. He's, you yeah. know, the second leader, and... He's got all these muscles, and he's winning, and second in charge, and yeah. he wins the girl. Mm -hmm. But he's a little okay. self-righteous. Okay. He's a little judgmental. Yeah. So we've learned a little bit about yeah. the consequences of that, too. Yeah, no, which makes sense. I mean, you know, that's maybe a little bit more the chosen route. Yeah. <laughs> you know, those things aren't really in there. But, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a good thing just to imagine that and even yeah. see, like, these are real people, the real lives. Uh, and, you know, it's helpful to kind of say, like, okay, if they are like you and me, that they had these conversations, they had real relationships, and, you know, they were messy and human, yeah. uh, but ultimately God used them and worked with them and and all things for, you know, for his glory to save the whole world, you know, through these, you know, through Salmon, through Rahab, you know, clearly, I mean, you know, obviously Rahab and, you know, Salmon too, maybe, probably, of, like, you know, not the greatest people in the world you'd see originally is like you wouldn't expect anything great uh, to happen, you know, especially with Rahab. But it's like by God's mercy, by her, you know, active faith, uh, her belief in God, you know, it's this amazing story of, you know, not only is she a key figure in helping Israel, you know, be brought into the Holy Land, but also, you know, she is an instrument for the whole world's salvation through Jesus. So pretty. Pretty amazing story overall. And, and gives us that hope that we yeah. can even be uh, a prostitute and there's still yeah. time. There's still mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. saving to be done. Yeah. And and in fact it's you know, it's it's a fascinating story too to see that, you know, and, and maybe you know, maybe think of like, you know, why would anyone write about Rahab specifically mm, yeah. of all the right. a people whole in book. the Bible? You know, <laughs> a whole book and you know, this whole imaginative story. Well it's like Rahab has like time and again been this figure that Christians have gone back to and seen as really a model uh, for other Christians, mm -hmm. which is kind of funny. You know, think about it, it's like, okay, so we're holding up a prostitute, right? Right. <laughs> you know, as, as, the, as the guide for a Christian life. The first know, couple uh, chapters yeah. are also a little hard, so mm -hmm. <laughs> here we are. Yeah, and but it's like even in the New Testament, there's there's a couple times in in the New Testament that she's brought up as this example of faith of her good works, you know, of, of God's mercy. So in, in the book of Hebrews and book of James. Uh, we hear about Rahab and the early church fathers, saints, theologians, they go back to her time and again and preach about her as almost this image of the church, even the whole church, mm -hmm. of, you know, saying, okay, well, all of us, you know, unless we're converts from Judaism, we didn't come from the chosen people. All go back far enough, our ancestors were pagans. <laughs> we were we were Gentiles. We were, you know, probably not that far off from the Canaanites, you know. Uh, but at some point, God in his mercy took us mm -hmm. from pagan idols and brought us into his chosen people, brought us into the church, brought us into, into Christianity. And and so Rahab is really that image of, you know, God's mercy and, you know, coming to all people for the whole world. Uh, but also, yeah, that, that story of conversion, like you said, that there's hope for no one's too far gone, no one's too far from God. And that, you know, anyone, if they repent, if they desire to follow God, uh, anyone God will accept will take back to himself. Uh, so there's there's always hope. I think is a one of the biggest lessons to take away from the life of Rahab, and probably one of the best reasons to write a book about it. I think too. So, well, thanks for giving us the real story, the Bible story. Mm -hmm. We've had a great time in our small groups um, discussing it, but adding this additional layer of facts um, has really helped us do that comparison and and learn about Bible study in a different way, but also validation that these characters yeah. and these events um, did in fact happen. Mm -hmm. So. Thank yeah. you, Father. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. I encourage you to read the read the book of Joshua. <laughs> not that long. Not that long. So it's a good story. Good story. But yeah, awesome. Well, thanks Great. again.
Thank you, Father. And, yeah, hopefully I can come in and talk to you guys sometime soon, <laughs> if not less. We'd love it. Yeah, not less, hopefully soon. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.